Thank you all for joining. Uh, my name is Ben and I'm the director of the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association. And we are an industry-based nonprofit. We were started by small boat community-based fishermen who believed that we needed to have an abundant natural resource in order to protect these small boat communities, rural communities throughout Maine. Uh, so we started this nonprofit to build a voice in the policy arena, and that was to identify and foster ways to restore the fisheries of the Gulf of Maine and sustain Maine's fishing communities for future generations. And as we have grown and evolved over time, uh, they hired me about 12 years ago. For a while, they were just, the fishermen tried to make a go of it themselves. Uh, and then they realized that they needed somebody in the meeting rooms all the time paying attention. Uh, so they hired me about 12 years ago to come to Maine, uh, build this organization in partnership with them. Uh, and while we started in policy, which is that sustainable fisheries piece of the equation, over time we realized that we needed to add other pieces to um, our piece of work in order to really support the people, the places, the marine resources uh, in a cohesive 360 degree view. So our programmatic work really falls into those different pieces. One is sustainable fisheries, uh, access preservation, business innovation, and then fishermen wellness. Uh, and to think about how we, the way that we are thinking about this more is less about these are our programs, but more along the lines of like, how are ways that we can be building stability around our fishing communities? And so that is not just about sustainable fisheries, but abundant natural resources in our oceans. Um, when we're talking about access, we're talking about working waterfronts and permits and quota. We need, it doesn't matter how many fish we have in the ocean, if we can't go out and get those fish, uh, it doesn't help our, our communities here in Maine. Uh, and then markets and price. If we have all the fish in the ocean and all the access that we want, if fishermen can't get paid for that, that fisheries, those, those resources, that seafood, then we don't have a fishery either. And then the final piece that is the newest piece of our work is uh, it's all about people in the end. And uh, we have not traditionally had a lot of support around those who are out on the water uh, producing food within this part of our food system. And so whether that is mental health or physical health, um, we need to do a better job of supporting the people in, in this space. And so there's definitely a lot of anxiety, depression, um, you know, substance abuse in the fishery. And so we are trying to put some mental health support around the fisheries. And then these are fishermen that they are, they are professional athletes. If their bodies stop working, they stop working. And so uh, trying to take some of the lessons that Tom Brady taught us and bring pliability, uh, a, lot of, a lot of stretching, a lot of strength training in the off season, um, we need their bodies to hold up. And, and so those are some of the different pieces of work that, that we've been doing as an organization. Um, we're not going to get into all those tonight, though. We're going to be mostly focusing on how our fisheries are managed, what our fisheries look like in Maine. Um, before we get to that, though, I do want to highlight one program that has been a real bright spot of our work um, as we've been kind of building and growing over the past couple of years. Uh, and that is our, our Fishmen Feeding Mainers program. And so during the pandemic, when all of our markets collapsed for fresh local seafood, uh, specifically those ground fish, those are things like cod, haddock, flounder, flaky white fish that usually end up in restaurants. Uh, we went out and we raised money and we uh, got access to COVID relief funds. And we were able to start buying fish from fishermen at a fair market price, donating that into local food insecure communities and also schools uh, and, uh, and really be able to stabilize market and provide amazing quality seafood to local folks. Uh, so over the past couple of years, we've been able to donate over 850,000 meals through this program. Uh, and while that is definitely the, the cherry on the cake, for us coming from the fishing community side, um, we've been able to not just stabilize markets when they were collapsing, but we were also able to step in and start to drive prices higher. And this is a chart of prices uh, for many of those flaky whitefish, pollock, hake, cod, flounder uh, that get landed in, in Portland, uh, there's a public auction there for those species. So you can see this is from all the way back to 2012. Uh, fish prices haven't moved or they've gone down. And you can see right on this chart where in 2020, uh, at the end of 2020, we started to buy fish at the Portland Fish Exchange. Um, and we've been able to raise prices, we've been able to stabilize prices. And with that comes a lot of benefit to the working waterfront, the fishermen, the natural resources even. We have fishermen targeting things that are healthy, not necessarily things that are the most profitable. Um, 
and it's been a real bright spot and something that we are we are looking to continue to maintain and uh, steward forward as a long term program of the organization. Uh, as another piece of that equation, we also realized that some of the species, like monkfish, are uh, something that people are not necessarily familiar with. So we built a value added product, Maine Coast Monkfish Stew, which you can purchase. Uh, there's about 60 different places throughout Maine that sir uh, that have it as a uh, it's a frozen product that you can pick up. Um, that's heat and serve. Uh, it's delicious. It's amazing, and it features monkfish, which is an underutilized, sustainable fish that not very many people are familiar with. So we thought this was a great way to start introducing people through it through donations, and then so many people loved it that we started to make um, a, a product that we sell, and we also get into schools and, and other places like that as well. So that is high level overview of some of the different pieces of work that we're doing uh, as an organization and in this program in particular. Uh, now on to the actual topic uh, at hand. Uh, and when I give presentations, I always like to start with a picture of what we're talking about, which is the Gulf of Maine. And while many of us um, in the back of our head kind of get where this is or what this means, it's a big body of water, right? It's not just the ocean. It is this, this low, uh, this area that's a light blue. It's a shallower area. There's a lot of shallow area in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, and there's these currents that are coming from uh, Nova Scotia, they're cold water currents that are bringing lots of nutrients, cold water into this giant bathtub in the Gulf of Maine. We've got a lot of rivers and streams that are bringing nutrients and fresh water into it uh, from, uh, from the rivers, from ice melt, from the snow melt. And then we've got George's Bank over here uh, to the southern that kind of builds a wall on the other side. And so this has made the Gulf of Maine one of the most productive ecosystems in the world. And we are lucky enough to be a part of that ecosystem. We're lucky enough to have fishermen um, that are able to participate and go and manage and, and catch seafood out of that ecosystem. Uh, but it is really, really special. And um, I always like to remind people of like the scale, the scope, and what we're talking about and looking at when we talk about the, the Gulf of Maine. Uh, it's also complex though, right? So this is a simplified food web of the Gulf of Maine. All of these little things are connected to each other. There's cod, there's fish, there's uh, shellfish, there's all the plankton, there's uh, marine mammals and the birds and everything is all connected. And you start pulling on one of these little strings and it's gonna impact everything along the way. And the big uh, shark in this equation is humans. And that's not just what we're catching when it comes to putting a net in the water or a, a hook in the water. It's also pollution, it's also development. It's all of the things that connect to all of these little strings. And so just remembering that like we are trying to manage a very large, very complex ecosystem um, when we are talking about fisheries management is important. Uh, the other piece of this equation is obviously money, right? I work with fishermen, this is how they make a living. Um, and along the coast of Maine, the uh, fisheries are a big piece of our economy and it's been a shifting piece of our economy. So the graph to the left is uh, what it looked like in terms of the pie chart of income over uh, the course of a year in 1995, where we have a fairly even distribution um, weighted heavily towards urchins and lobster, lobsters, but we had a lot of ground fish and scallops and shrimp making up this $180 million worth of value coming across the docks in Maine. Uh, in 2022, that pie chart looks very different. It's mostly lobster um, and that other species, which is the other piece of that equation that may, or other piece of the pie that looks big. That's a lot of other things that are all put into that. So um, the piece of the pie that is lobster has grown. The pie has grown, though. We've gone from 180 million to 547 million. So there's a lot of value coming out of our ocean. Um, it's locked up in lobster, though, and, and that's a dangerous place for us to be. It's been a very a uh, fortunate place for us to be over the last 20 years. But if things change, it means we have put a lot of eggs into to one, uh, one trap or, or, or lobster pot, if you will. So we've got a lot of value in the ocean. We've got a complex ecosystem. And then we've asked people to manage that ecosystem. And uh, in fisheries management, despite how complex all of our regulations may be, and they are complex when we talk about fisheries management, um, we have documents that are hundreds of pages long that outline all of the rules and regulations when it comes to how to catch a fish and all the different permits and um, variabilities and analysis that goes into that. But really, we can only manage one thing, 
And that is the number of fish that come out of the ocean. So we've got two really bins of ways that, bins of tools. We've got ways that we can limit fishing effort or activity, and that is called an input measure. And then we've got limiting, we've got ways to limit harvest amount, and that is called an output measure. And so um, I'm going to be, as we talk about the different fisheries in the Gulf of Maine, I'm going to be continuously kind of referencing back to these different types of management tools that we have. Um, some of them are complex, some of them, but, but really it's only about, we can limit the amount of effort that's going in, or we can limit the number of pounds that are coming out, right? So just really high level, limiting fishing effort or activity. As a lobsterman, you're only allowed a certain number of traps to fish. We are limiting your fishing effort. Uh, in certain fisheries like ground fish, we give you a certain number of pounds of fish you're allowed to catch over the course of the year, like a cap and trade system. Um, so that is limiting the output, right? We are at science is saying you can catch a certain amount of things. And when you catch that, you're cut off output. Input, you've got certain amount of gear that you're allowed to fish, a certain number of days that you're allowed to fish. Um, that's an input. We're trying to, to limit the amount of energy going into a system. So those are the different tools. Uh, and many fisheries combine tools from both of these piles um, to, to do the management. And then fish, fisheries management, it doesn't much like, unlike our, our land where we uh, know where the lines are drawn and we know where the trees are or where the animals are moving. Um, we have fisheries management that is broken into to different chunks of the ocean, um, but the species definitely don't like to stay within those chunks. They don't uh, pay attention to the lines that we're drawing. So we have municipal or intertidal uh, management. We've got state water uh, management, which is from uh, the low tide mark out to three miles. We've got federal fisheries management, which is from three miles out to 200 miles. And then we've got international management, which is outside of 200 miles. I am not going to be talking about international fisheries management because that is the wild, wild west of fisheries management. We are still trying to figure that out. And in Maine, we don't have a lot of boats that participate in those fisheries. Those are tuna fisheries. Um, those are uh, swordfish fisheries. We have some really, you know, some larger businesses that do that. For the most part, though, those are not Maine businesses. Um, so we're going to ignore that for the majority of this conversation. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take us from the shore out to federal waters, and we're going to talk a little bit about each one of the fisheries, um, or use an example fishery to talk about the fisheries management within, within that area. So if we're talking about municipal fisheries, um, intertidal fisheries, and the ones that are important to Maine are clams, worms. Uh, we use worms as bait. So there's a, a lot of people that, that want worms when they're going out fishing as a type of bait. Um, or in uh, they will use worms to feed fish in tanks or other things like that. Uh, and river herring. Uh, clams, there are soft, soft shell clams. There are uh, hard shell clams, razor clams. So there's a lot of different varieties that come out of this intertidal uh, area. The way that this is managed, though, is by the municipality. They have a certain number of licenses that they issue to members of the public, whether those are residents or non-residents of the town. Uh, but all these municipalities are fairly constrained. They will have working groups, they'll have volunteer groups that kind of put together management plans, um, but they rely on the state heavily to inform the science that comes to how much can come out of the ocean, uh, the areas that might need to be closed, either because of over-harvest or because of pollution in those areas, red tide management, right? So we've got the science that comes from the feds. Um, some of that will be informed if a town or municipality is particularly invested in the success of a fishery, they might invest in um, some types of, of management or science or um, remediation projects with um, the intertidal areas. Uh, in Harpswell, close to where I live, uh, they collect Christmas trees at the end of the Christmas season and they put them out in the ocean in certain areas to collect spat so that they can start growing uh, shellfish and putting that into the intertidal. So there's things that you can do as a municipality um, that's very, very uh, volunteer based. Uh, and then those permits, so that comes down to access, right? Permits, access, uh, that comes from the town. Uh, they will usually issue permits to those who live in the town first, um, and then they will have some set aside for out-of-town out of, out of town, um, uh, folks who are interested. But 
it, it all depends on the town. It depends on the, the volunteers. It depends on a lot of those things, but it's municipal level management of a fishery. That's down to low tide. Uh, so one of the fisheries that I had not talked about when I was talking about municipality is one a really cool one. It's a very antiquated one, though, is river herring. And so river herring um, have been returning to our rivers. We've been taking the dams out of the ocean, out of our rivers um, to rebuild these, these river runs. Um, and fishermen love river herring as bait in lobster traps. Uh, so when river herring are running, um, they set up sustainable management plans uh, and then the municipalities, the towns, they license people to go and harvest river herring um, from certain rivers, but they have to stay within a very strict quota. They have to stay within their limits. They have to put together a plan for management and conservation. Um, very forward looking, which is really cool because there are not very many river herring runs left in the United States that allow any commercial harvest. And so Maine, because of this cooperative management and really forward thinking, um, not only removing of dams, but taking uh, conservation, putting that first in the harvesting rules, um, we've been able to rebuild these runs and allow fishermen to um, capitalize on using that local, fresh, amazing bait uh, in their lobster traps. So moving outside that intertidal area, so we leave the uh, the low low water mark and we continue on our boat now into the away from the mud and onto the water. Uh, and so the state fisheries, that's from zero to three miles, um, are lobsters. There's a scallop fishery, menhaden, which is a type of bait fish. Elvers, despite elvers coming into our rivers, that is managed by the state. So it's very similar to river herring, but we manage it differently because we don't like to be consistent. So um, once again, like state fisheries, different states have different rules when it comes to their state waters fisheries. There's one uh, management body called the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries though, that tries to pull together all those states to cohesively manage at a high level. They kind of put the guide rails in place for different levels of management, whether that's through um, the best available science, collecting that, um, putting that out in the world. You know, a lot of these different species, uh, species like Menhaden, they go all the way from Florida to Maine. And uh, we have to have a management plan that looks at the entire scope of that ecosystem of that range in order to appropriately management, manage it. Uh, then they kind of say, all right, states, here's what you get to work with. And then the states get to develop their management plans within that broader scope of, of work. So uh, lobsters, our state issues lobster licenses. Um, there's a certain number of, of licenses that are available. Uh, in order to get one, you either have to go up through a, um, a, a, an apprenticeship program through student licenses, or you have to sit on a wait list to, uh, to get, get pulled off of a wait list to, to get a permit. Uh, they're non-transferable. So if you have a permit and you'd like to give it to your kid, you cannot do that. If you'd like to sell it, you cannot do that. They, we have no transferable licenses in our state waters fisheries. Uh, scallop fishery, there's only so many scallop permits that are available. Uh, if you wanna get a scallop permit, you have to join a lottery. And every year there's only a handful of scallop permits that become available and some lucky person um, is handed a scallop permit because they entered a lottery. So there are great things that come along with that. There are also um, some real real concerns about you know how do you make sure that those that uh, deserve a fair shake at these get a fair shake. And, and it's hard in any type of management process where you're saying, we are going to limit the number of permits that are available. That's called a limited access fishery. And um, most of the fisheries in Maine are limited access. Um, the one that is not on this list that I should have added is halibut because it is halibut season right now. We have a state waters halibut uh, fishery. That's actually an open access fishery. And so when we were talking about those management tools, right? Um, effort versus you know input versus output uh, with, with halibut, there are unlimited licenses. Anybody can go and get a commercial halibut license to go catch halibut. But each individual who wants to get that license only has a certain number of fish that they're allowed to catch over the course of the year. You're given a tag. So right now, I believe it's 20 or 25 tags a fisherman's allowed to go catch over the course of the year. Um, and the season is short. It's only uh, actually a couple of months, um, a little bit, little bit less than two months. So short season, um, 
but it's a fishery that is amazing that people can go and catch um, these goliath of fish and uh, land them locally. And it's a really, really cool, cool fishery. Um, so that's where like those permits come in. That's a part of the management program, but this is managed at the state level. And uh, we have the Department of Marine Resources that does both science and management and permit issuing. Uh, but for big changes within any of these fisheries, you have to go through our state legislature to, to make changes to, to how we operate these fisheries. Um, and that's really hard, right? You have a lot of people who are uninformed about fisheries management um, who are now thrust into the position of having to make really big, hard decisions about how we manage these resources. Um, and we have problems with that. The Menhaden fishery, we, we've been going through some limiting of permits in the Menhaden fishery, and um, it's turned into a bit of a disaster because people are trying to come up with good rules and regulations um, through the legislature without a lot of the experiences that you might need to put those good rules and, and guide rails in place to effectively manage that fishery moving forward. So um, those are our state waters fisheries. Lobsters is obviously our most important one, as I showed you in that, that pie chart. Um, it's a huge, huge chunk of revenue. Uh, we have over 4,500 fishermen in the state of Maine who participate in this fishery. And um, you know, we are very, very fortunate to have such a amazing, profitable fishery in Maine. The other thing that makes it really special, though, is um, lobster is what's called owner operated. So if you are a lobster fisherman and you own a permit and you own a boat, in order for that boat to go out fishing, you have to be on it. And that might sound uh, very simple in our world. Like, oh, of course, you got to be out on the boat to go catch the lobsters. In most fisheries around the world, that's not how it works. You can own a boat, you can own a permit, and you can hire somebody else to go and run that business for you. Um, so that's that's one of the things that makes this fishery. It's a small boat fishery. It's a you know small scale fishery. Uh, and it's because of that owner operator provision that's in the rules that makes it such a an amazing uh, just example of community based management, tying it back to communities and making sure um, that we're not losing that community um, around, you know, the the all the important pieces of ownership of access when it comes to permits. Um, there's a lot of fisheries, scallops, federal water scallops. I'll touch on that in a little bit. But a federal wa federal water scallop permit for a big boat can cost five to seven million dollars, and you can own as many of them as you would like. So big businesses can come in and buy up a lot of permits, a lot of access, a lot of scallops, um, and you know they they can start to control a fishery, and we don't allow that to happen in in Maine. So now we're going to move out to federal fisheries. And so that is three miles to 200 miles. Uh, we're in the Gulf of Maine, though. So that 200 miles is not actually 200 miles in most places. We start bumping up to Canadian waters. Uh, and anytime you bump into Canadian waters, um, we have to have a shared management plan around uh, those species. And we also have some overlap of areas. Uh, it's called the gray zone in down east Maine. Uh, and there's always contentious uh, issues around the gray zone with one group of fishermen being allowed to fish and another group not being allowed to fish. So uh, I just use that as an example of 200 miles. We say it, it's not usually 200 miles in a place like Maine where we've got another, another uh, country bumping up against us. Um, so, Federal fisheries. This is actually where I and the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association spend most of our time um, and energy in the policy world. Um, the, the boats that started our organization were small boat ground fish fishermen. So ground fish, things like cod, haddock, flounder, uh, they were going through a period of transition around 2010 in how they were managed. They were going from an, um, an a, a system that was uh, an input-based system of management. They were allowed a certain number of days to go fishing and a certain number of pounds of fish on each one of those days to, uh, to catch. So they were going from what was called a days at sea system to an output-based system, which was an allocation-based system, a cap-and-trade-based system, where they were going to use science to tell the fishermen how many pounds could come out of the ocean. Uh, each fisherman was going to be allocated out a certain number of pounds to catch, um, and we were going to have to manage that. Uh, we do manage that. So during that transition period, um, all these fishermen that are, were fishing for groundfish in Maine realized that not only did they need to have a voice in the policy arena, but they needed some help shoreside to be tracking 
catch and discards and the movement of fish in this cap and trade system. And so that's when I got hired was when the fishermen in the groundfish fishery saw that they needed support on shore to make sure that they had voice, but also that all the important science and data and management had somebody taking care of that while they were out fishing. So um, that's that's one, one species, the, the scallop fishery, herring, monkfish, uh, these are all federal fisheries that are important to Maine. Um, there's a lot of other federal fisheries that um, we participate in, in small ways or large ways. Some of them are coming into the Gulf of Maine as climate change warms our waters. So we're starting to see a lot more uh, squid in the Gulf of Maine. Scallops are something that like we might benefit from warming waters as uh, those that are traditionally a, a southern New England species start moving into the Gulf of Maine more. So these things are, are uh, real opportunities. Uh, and this is where we spend a lot of time uh, and work trying to make sure that for those, a, a place like Maine, where we have so much invested in the lobster fishery, we kind of have to be working overtime to protect our access into these other fisheries because they could be bought up, they can be moved, they can be transitioned out, we can lose the access with permits, we can lose the access with uh, the infrastructure that we need. And once it's gone, it's gone forever. And if we suddenly see that there's opportunity in any of these fisheries, it'll be really hard to claw it back. So it's really valuable for us that believe in seafood as an opportunity in our state, that believe that we want diverse fishing opportunity to diverse fishing businesses, these are the most important fisheries for us to be making sure that we have management advocacy voice around in, in the arena. So federal fisheries management is really, really cool uh, because Congress realized in, uh, that they don't want to manage fisheries. Uh, unlike the Farm Bill, where every five years or so, the Congress gets together and has a gigantic fight about how we want to um, deal with farmers around the country, uh, Congress in 1976 said, New England is really different from Alaska, and Alaska is really different from Hawaii, and New England's really different from the Gulf of Mexico. So they set up eight regional councils to do a cooperative management style of um, development of management, right? So there are fishermen that sit on these councils, there's state leaders, um, there's conservation leaders, there's federal leaders. Uh, and so there are these eight regional councils that develop the local management um, from a, I won't say bottom up approach, but I'd say middle, middle up and down approach um, to uh, policy creation. And it's really, really interesting to be a part of that and have fishermen feel as though they can have an idea and they can have a path to fighting for that, but isn't having to go down to Washington DC and lobby and get access to um, elected officials who have really, really big, important things that they're working on that have nothing to do with the number of cod in the ocean. Um, and so from 1976 until today, um, we've been evolving how we want to manage our fisheries. Um, in 1976, all we wanted to do was kick the big boat foreign fleet out. So that's when we got that 200 mile limit was in 1976. We kicked out Russian boats and Icelandic boats um, and said, only boats that are flying an American flag and permitted in the United States can get access to these fisheries. Then we realized that we were still overfishing these fish stocks and it wasn't just the foreigners that were the problem. Apparently it was us too. And um, so we started to say, we need to manage for rebuilding. We need to manage using the best available science. We need to reduce bycatch within our fisheries management. So, <clears throat> excuse me, it's one of the things that actually makes me most optimistic about fisheries management is we didn't start managing our fisheries until 1976. We didn't start using science until 1996. And we didn't really start saying, you need to be rebuilding in certain timelines. You need to be reducing bycatch. You need to be doing things for the ecosystem until 2006. So one, I don't come from a fishing family. I don't come from a fishing background. Um, I come from a policy background. Um, my dad owned a small, a small business in New Hampshire. Um, I come to this from the idea of like, we are still figuring out how to manage this ecosystem, these people, these places. And I believe really strongly in the, the best way to build durable, lasting, 
um, management is by getting those who are on the water and in the impacted parties involved early in the development so they have buy-in in in the in the solution buy-in in the outcomes so that's what makes this a really really interesting process and we are still figuring it out um so that's that's one of the really cool things about our federal fisheries management um the the ground fish fishery so i'm gonna go through a couple of these little examples here um so the ground fish fishery cod haddock flounder this was the fishery that we built New England on the back of, right? Cod, cod is incredibly important because you can salt it and it keeps. It is a durable protein that you can store and you can ship and it can last. And so that was what funded a lot of the work in uh, the starting of the United States. Um, it fed our troops over and over again. So the groundfish fishery is incredibly important. But we, we have decimated this fishery over the decades. Um, but we are seeing really great signs that it's coming back. And um, there's complex management in place now. It's a cap and trade system. We work with fishermen right now um, that are really invested in creating great data um, that's going back into the science, good management that's coming from fishermen that fishermen are invested in, and trying to contribute to a better future here. This was the fishery that our organization was founded to try and fix and engage on. And we are seeing real opportunity here. There are still some black marks on it that are problems, but one of the most opportunistic things that I can say is like, we've been targeting cod for hundreds and hundreds of years, and we still have cod in the ocean. Um, and we shouldn't take that for granted. Like, we killed off the passenger pigeon in a matter of decades. Um, we almost drove the bison to extinction because they taste delicious, right? Like, we, we still have fish in our ocean, despite them being delicious and right out our back door. And one is because we're not really good at catching them. It's hard to catch them. But two is because they rebound really quickly, right? These species, they grow fast, they reproduce quickly. And so if you give them good management and we use good science, there's a ton of opportunity for this fishery to explode. And we've seen that. Um, we saw that about 10 years ago in Haddock. We saw that about seven years ago in Pollock. Um, we are seeing it right now in flounder, where there's a lot of flounder that are starting to pop up in our ocean, um, which is awesome. Like so, so, so good because ground fish is food, right? This is something that we should all be eating more of. It's good for our brains. It's good for our bodies. Uh, it's good for the ecosystem. Uh, when you're catching fish, we aren't using any fresh water. There's no hormones. There's no antibiotics. And um, it's it's really carbon friendly too, right? Like when you start doing an analysis, it's you know right there around chicken when it comes to the carbon footprint, if not less in, in some instances. So it's a really great system. Um, and it's one we're really invested in the success and future of. Um, as I said, it's a cap and trade system though. So there's permits out there that um, you know, we are working with the Nature Conservancy around to go and buy permits and hold them in trust in Maine to provide access for local fishermen. Uh, because we believe that right now is the time to be investing in the future of this fishery for our state and for our communities and for our fishermen, uh, for our food system. And so this is uh, a really cool opportunity that there's a lot of, um, there's a bright future in ground fish, I believe. Um, and so this is uh, a place that often gets left behind in a lot of our policy conversations, a lot of our investments in the state because lobster is so important to us economically. But Fish is food, and, and this is one of the reasons why our Fisherman Feeding Mainers program has been so amazingly impactful is because we are able to reconnect people in our communities with food from our oceans. And for a long time, there's been a big barrier between what's coming out of our oceans and uh, what's going on people's plates, uh, besides lobster, which, you know, I love lobster, I do, but it is more of a celebration than it is a, a, a food staple, right? Uh, and uh, it's a great economic driver and it is delicious, but I'm not eating lobster every week. I, I am eating flaky whitefish every week. Um, and, and that's something that we should all be doing more of. The other one that's really fun and cool is scallops. And so scallops, I'm not gonna go into all the management because it's very, very complex. I already, I kind of touched on, there are these big permits that have, um, that are worth you know millions and millions of dollars. Uh, but one of the things that was really interesting was as we were going to this system of management that had these big permits created that are worth millions of dollars um, that represent uh, about uh, 
90% of all the allowable catch of, of scallops. Uh, someone at the Department of Marine Resources by the name of Terry Stockwell realized that through that management process, uh, Maine fishermen were going to get cut out of the equation. And so he created a special permit called the Northern Gulf of Maine permit and a special area called the Northern Gulf of Maine uh, scallop management area. And that is that orange chunk there that goes along our coast. Um, and it's just, just north of Cape Cod. And about uh, seven years ago, we started to see scallops returning to that area in significant numbers. And um, those big boats that wanted to kind of, that, that owned a big chunk of the fishery, they came up and started fishing in that area. Um, and so at the time, our fishermen were allowed, all of these main fishermen that own these permits, we were allowed 70,000 pounds of landings in total in a year. Um, and during one of those years, the big boats came and took a million pounds out of that area over the course of a month. And so we had to mobilize our fleet to go and engage in this management process, uh, show up at meetings and kind of put some, close some loopholes and protect access to this area for our small boats in Maine. And because we were able to get fishermen engaged, because we were get them um, down to these meetings and talking to people, um, sharing the stories of what it's like being a fisherman in Maine and the need to diversify um, all these things, we were able to close that loophole. And so um, two years ago, close to 800,000 pounds of, of scallops were harvested by uh, mostly Maine fishermen out of this area. And we think that over the, into the future, we're gonna see more scallops out here. And so um, it's a real great opportunity. Um, it's a weird management plan where fishermen are allowed, they have to have a permit. Um, and then you are allowed 200 pounds a day until all the scallops are harvested that were kind of allocated out by science. So this year, uh, there was only about 400,000 pounds of scallops that were allocated out to be caught. Um, we caught them in less than a month with the number of boats that were participating in the fishery. But it, each one of those scallops, the average price back to the boat was about 16 pounds um, back to the boat. So 200 pounds, $16 a pound um, on a short day with not a lot of overhead. It's a great way to get a little bit of income uh, at a time of year when you aren't making income from anything else as, as a fisherman. So um, really cool opportunity in the scallop fishery that's growing in Maine. We do have a state waters fishery. So when we go back to that chart of management, right, um, we have a state waters fisheries of scallops that is managed completely different from the federal waters fishery, completely different permits, different regulations uh, when it comes to the number of pounds that you can fish. They have rolling closed areas that they close for chunks of time in order to protect the fishery. So if the catch is too high um, or starts to slow down in an area, they shut it down. Like there's really interesting management in our state waters when it comes to scallops. And then we have just, just over the other side of a three mile line, completely different management, completely different permits. It's, it's really, that's one of the reasons why I have great job security is because our fishermen need to know how these permits interact with each other, what the rules and regulations are from one side of the line to the other. And we need to find ways to get those things to line up so that it benefits the natural resources and it benefits the communities and the families. So, um, how am I doing on time? Let's see. Oh, very close. Perfect. So um, the final two things that I want to touch base on that are, um, you know, just a little bit less on the management side, but more uh, a little bit closer to home is working waterfront. So early on in the presentation, I talked about access being a priority for our organization. One piece of access is permits, right? So you have to buy a permit, have access to a permit to go catch fish, scallops, um, muscles, whatever it is. Um, in federal waters, those permits can cost a lot of money. That, that Northern Gulf of Maine scallop permit that I was talking about, right now they're going for $150,000 a piece because there's only a handful of them that exist. There's about a hundred of them that exist, right? So um, if you want one, you got to pay for it. Ground fish permits, those can go from anywhere between $20,000 to millions of dollars, depending upon what's on those permits for allocation. So um, that type of access is really important. We've been doing a lot of work to help fishermen uh, understand permits, how they can finance them, what that looks like for their business. The other piece of that is working waterfront though. Uh, if you don't have a place to tie up your boat, if you don't have a place to land your product, you're not coming home to Maine. So 
Um, this has been a space that has been kind of ignored for a very long time in our state because um, it's not a state issue. It is considered a municipal issue. And all of you live in towns and municipalities that are underfunded, understaffed, and have a lot of different issues that are coming their way. Um, working waterfront is hard. There's no real money out there to protect working waterfront. We have one fund in Maine. It's called the Land for Maine's Future uh, Fund. Um, it's bonded and you have to have very specific projects that can qualify for money that can come in and buy the development rights of a piece of working waterfront with an injection of cash. But unlike farmland, unlike conservation land, we don't have a lot of tools in the toolbox when it comes to working waterfront. So um, the Maine Coast, Fishermen's Association, the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association has invested a lot of time recently trying to figure out how to, one, empower fishermen and municipalities to fight, protect, understand um, what tools we do have to protect and preserve working waterfront, and make sure that it's protected in a way that allows for future investment as those fisheries change, as the seafood changes that might come out of the ocean, um, as we have aquaculture growth, right? Like all of these things, we can't put working waterfront and amber and call it good because it looks cute, right? Like this is working. It needs to be able to evolve as our fisheries evolve. Um, and the other thing that we realized was we don't track working waterfront. So we, we just launched, launched a working waterfront inventory project that a municipality, a land trust, somebody can go through and inventory their working waterfront infrastructure and start to categorize it, right? Is this commercial? Is it owned by an individual? Is it owned by the town? Is it a yacht club? Did it used to be a seafood working waterfront that is now a boatyard, right? Like those types of transitions, they don't pop up in a lot of reports because it's still working waterfront, right? A yacht club, something that might be um, you know, being used to create offshore wind turbines, um, something that's used by local harvesters or recreation, like all of those things are all considered working waterfront. And we, we don't track what they are um, being used for as, as municipalities. So we are trying to empower those to do that. So working waterfront, super important. We're gonna be launching some campaigns around this soon to start raising awareness around um, the needs of the working waterfront. But um, for those of you in communities that are on working waterfront communities, um, recognizing the importance of the municipality to care is the first step towards making sure that we're doing a good job. Um, and then the final piece I'll share, and then we can go to questions, is just um, despite my starting to lose my voice, I hope you can hear the optimism that I have about our fisheries. Is um, I think that we are just starting to see the edge of a really, really bright future for better management with better science going into um, our management. And that's for a couple of reasons. One is, as I shared, like we're still figuring out fisheries. And the science and the data is the hardest piece. And we are, we are starting to get there. There's still a ways to go, but it's really, it's an interesting time in the data collection world. And um, fishermen are turning, getting turned into data collectors, which is awesome. The second thing is like, we have a resilient ecosystem that is like, it's, it's, it's rebounding right now. We're seeing fish stocks come back that we never thought would come back. Um, and so there's lots of opportunity in just like the resilience of the fishers themselves. And then the final thing is like, seafood is good food. It's important food. And we're in the next 30 years, we're gonna have over 10 billion people in the world. They all need to eat. And we have out our back door, a ecosystem that produces protein without us having to till the soil, without us having to put antibiotics in the water, fresh water use, uh, like no energy except for like the small amount to put put a boat on the water and like cut a fish like it's it's an amazing it's almost a magical process in the creation of a fish and um and so i see a ton of opportunity out in the ocean when it comes to us being part of a food system that is feeding a world that is demanding better quality food and we have some of the best quality food in the world out our back door that right now we catch and we wave goodbye to as it goes to Boston or Chicago or New York. And so that's why I think there's tons of opportunity in this space and why I'm excited to be working here and always sharing my optimism and opportunity um, when it comes to how our fisheries are managed, what our fishermen are doing to make this place, a, make the world a little bit better um, and the ways that our organization um, is hoping to connect everybody 
back to that that Gulf of Maine ecosystem. So uh, I will stop there and stop sharing. And um, I don't know if there's any uh, anything that popped up in the chat, but um, here we go. Thank you. And we do have some questions for you. This has been really interesting. So first question is, are there other maritime careers that some fishing families have been able to transition to? Yeah, I mean, we are starting to see fishermen transition into using aquaculture as a piece of their business. Um, you know, that being said, it takes a certain mindset to grow things. Um, many fishermen are really good at, at catching things. Um, and the stewardship of growing uh, growing something is, is a little bit different. But we're seeing that, especially with like seaweed aquaculture, that's a short term, um, fast turnaround. Um, there's a ton of opportunity in there. And that's, that's, that's real great. Um, and then, you know, we, there's a lot of fishermen that are merchant maritime, you know, Marines, like they go out, they, they operate tugs, they do different things for parts of the year. Um, but for the most part, you know, the fishermen that, you know, they, they go from one fishery to another, um, when the opportunity presents itself. And so, um, you know, we, we are actually doing a little bit of work right now, um, with, you know, there's a lot of things that are changing in our ecosystem. There's a lot of new rules and regulations that are going to be coming when it comes to the lobster fishery with the whales and wind and other stuff on our oceans. So we are trying to figure out what are the pieces of work that you can add to your fishing business that you can then take out into your community to add value, right? So um, if you already know how to weld, a lot of these fishermen, they know how to weld, they might know how to dive, uh, electrical, like there's a lot of these things that they know how to do. They just might need to get certified to be able to do that and um, and add that to a piece of their their annual round. So um, you know, so it's interesting. We're trying to figure that out, but we are not in the business of converting fishermen into non fishermen. We want more of them. That's that's our belief. Is that there's a lot of opportunity in the ocean if we can um, put the right structure in place. Thank you. And does your organization address address issues such as how climate change and pollution affects on the fisheries? Yeah, I mean, we um, we don't do anything when it really comes down to the impact. Um, you know that those we are a small nonprofit, so um, limited staff, limiting capacity. We try and do our best in the sphere that we have impact. So what we tend to do is we partner with others who can can bring our voice into those conversations. Um, we work closely with the Nature Conservancy, with the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, other places like that to share experiences that fishermen have, um, use the data that fishermen are, are collecting to inform some of those conversations, especially around climate change, um, and engage in conversations around like how fishermen can help provide um, solutions to climate change, right? Like um, whether it's transitioning to cleaner types of fuel, the, one of the simplest things, and I, it's very self-serving, and I recognize it, is like getting people to eat fish instead of steak and beef, right? Like those types of things are incredibly valuable for our own personal, um, you know, carbon footprint when it comes to climate change. But um, we, we at this point, at least within our capacity, we we tend to stay in our lane when it comes to climate change and saying like we. We're going to let the experts go and try and figure out some of that. We will contribute where we can, but we don't think we're going to be able to be the drivers on 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 that big big issue. Um, for pollution, though, there's a couple of different layers to that. One is, yes, like we are always talking about trying to make sure that things do not end up in the ocean. Um, and one of the pieces of that is like educating community members about what it means to actually buy a piece of property next to the ocean. Um, we just published a uh, a fun little just educational piece for Harpswell um, called Scuttlebutt, and so it's something that we are we're doing it with a couple of other towns now after that one. But it's it's something that we hand to new residents. Um, that's like here's what is, you're living in a working waterfront community. Here are the things you need to know, right? And some of them are like really simple, like you know, like it's it's going to be really humid in your house all the time so be prepared that your crackers are going to go stale right um or like if you are putting certain types of um things on your lawn to kill insects well that's going into the ocean and that might be killing really important pieces of our ecosystem in the ocean that we rely on that either feed lobsters or groundfish or um cod or striped bass or anything else but like some of those things kill those species like 
lobsters, right? Like, so um, there, there's a lot of that type of education. And then the final one is like, in a lot of our communities, we have old housing structures that like, they might still have stuff going in the ocean that is, should be going into, um, you know, the sewer system um, or the septic. And so, you know, it's like, how do you do education around that when it comes to what each of us can kind of do about, you know, not just throwing trash, no one should be throwing trash away, right? But it's often the things that are forgotten that are overlooked when you are building a new piece of, you know, building something on your property or putting fertilizer on your lawn or just trying to kill those stupid ants that are driving you nuts, right? And so it's that type of education stuff that we're we're really invested in trying to do um, without pointing the finger to say like, you're really doing something wrong instead of saying like, how can we all do better in this space? Um, we're trying to build a team. We work with fishermen. There's not a lot of fish, like there's not a lot of fishermen. If we want to be a, you know, a policy driver, that means we need community members on our team. We, we want everybody who moves to Maine to care deeply about the success of our fisheries, about the health of our ocean ecosystem, um, and invested in the future there. You're not coming to Maine, uh, because you hate, you hate the way that it looks with the working waterfront, right? Like, and so once you're here, it's about, finding ways that you can become a part of the community and, and invest in, in our shared success. Do hatcheries for fish like the Atlantic salmon affect fisheries at all? No, uh, you know, Atlantic salmon in particular, right? Like Atlantic salmon is a native species that um, because of dams and, you know, whatnot, like we've decimated that population. So um, you're kind of reintroducing something that should exist in our oceans um, if it gets out there. Um, in the past, there have been some that have tried to do hatcheries for things like cod that have not really not really worked. Uh, they also tried it with, with lobsters with varying degrees of success, whether it worked or not. We don't really know. It's hard to track those things. Um, so it, it's hard to track the outcomes of hatcheries when it comes to either, you know, their success in reintroducing or rebuilding or stabilizing um, ecosystem. On the other side, like you can introduce um, pathogens, you can introduce disease if you don't do it the right way. And, and there have been some bad experiences in Maine around those things. I think that's where like there is going to be as we move forward in time with large scale aquaculture growth is the questions around certain species that you might be growing in our ocean that, you know, can spread disease that can escape that can repopulate like those are things that our state is very concerned about um and are taking the time to to really dig into and understand before they do any permitting um in in a lot of these areas so. do our neighboring states and provinces also have owner operator requirements for the lobster fishery uh i don't know about provinces uh neighboring states do not so. And another specific question, what happened to the urchin fishery? It looked to be all, almost as big as lobsters in the 1995 chart and not even visible in the more recent chart. Yeah, uh, we caught a lot of urchins. So urchins are a species that um, tend to boom and bust. And, uh, and so they were exploding in population uh, and they're, um, they were incredibly valuable in um, overseas markets. Um, and so, and they were incredibly valuable right when they were getting ready to spawn because it was the gonads that were actually part of a, a sushi that was really prized uh, in, in, um, in Japan. And so you would have fishermen uh, that were going out and, and catching them. It was an unregulated fishery. Anybody who wanted a permit could go get a permit to catch, to catch churches. Um, so um, the state did not put good management in place to control harvest um, of that species. We now have limited access into that fishery, um, but it, it did not, you know, that's a fishery that has not bounced back. Um, and it's, it's a weird one, though, because uh, depending who you talk to, some people would love to see that fishery come back. But we have a growing seaweed fishery in Maine, right? We have a we have a, an aquaculture kelp fishery that does not want to see that that species return in any abundance. Um, right now, one of my one of my best friends, he works for the Nature Conservancy out in California, and he actually called me to get connected to urchin uh, urchin fishermen out here because they want to kill off all the urchins off off the California coast 
because they are destroying their kelp forests out there. Um, and so that's what it's, it's just like, it's a really interesting question of like, oh, like we have an urchin management plan. We want to be rebuilding this because it's a great opportunity and we want ecosystem balance. But now we're also building a potentially really valuable kelp fishery that that is what urchins each eat. And they tend to be voracious predators that come in, swarm in and destroy a kelp forest, right? And so, um, so yeah, like you can, if you, I, I'm friends with a couple of, of uh, seaweed farmers and when they find an urchin, like you can hear, you can hear a little tone in their voice change uh, about like what that fishery might mean and, and what that looks like. So um, that's what happened to the urchin fishery. Thanks. And uh, okay, can you point us to a research to a resource that gives more information about the rebound of cod populations in the Gulf of Maine? Yeah, right now, uh, so I can point you at the most recent stock assessment to cod. Um, and so it, cod is actually, it's it's not rebounding right now. Cod is very stable, um, but um, cod is is a, we are also going through the process right now to try and figure out the cod stock structure, right? So that's a weird thing. I'll break that down and saying, so right now we manage cod in Gulf of Maine and on George's Bank. And um, what we have found through genetic mapping is that that's not actually like, where the genetic similarity exists between cod and where they move. So there's cod that's more similar in Southern Maine um, and like along the mid coast of Maine, that kind of wraps all the way down the back of Cape Cod. Um, and so we have not actually been managing cod very effectively when it comes to recognizing like where they spawn, who they spawn with, where their distinct um, you know, groups, groupings kind of exist right now. And so we're trying to figure that out. Um, the other thing that's really weird about cod is like, so if you think about how we collect data for, for our trawl, for, for our fisheries management, we drag a big net in the ocean behind a giant boat. And you can't take that net into places like inshore Gulf of Maine, where we have lots of lobster pots. Uh, and so some of my optimism around cod is not around the stock assessments. Like we, our stock assessments kind of show that there is a little bit of opportunity in the Gulf of Maine. The Georges Bank cod stock is not in great shape right now. Um, but when you talk to lobster fishermen, like don't tell anybody they're catching a lot of cod in their lobster traps. Um, and like they're seeing them, some of them turn that cod into bait. Others of them kiss the cod and throw them back over and the cod swims away. Right. But, um, I always like what I've seen over, you know, the past decade of working in this space is I'll be talking to lobstermen. They'll tell me what's coming up in their traps in abundance. And then a couple of years later, we'll start to see that pop in the stock assessment. So a couple of years ago, they were seeing lots and lots of hake in their stock, in their traps. And then we had a big jump in the hake stock. Um, and so like, those are, those are the indicators that, that like from the fisherman's side, we're trying to figure out how you get those kind of indicators into, into stock assessments that really rely on firm data points. Um, but yeah, but I'm, I'm happy to share information about where the, where the COD stuff management is going, but it is, um, you know, it is it is it is stabilizing, but it has been on a on a decline for a long time. And so there's, but we're starting to see some indicators in what our fishermen are catching that there we might, there might be some opportunity in that fishery coming. Thank you. And one more question. Um, so we're in the Searsport Belfast area. Do you know of a good fish market near Searsport? And where can we find monkfish stew around here? Uh, so that is a great question. Off the top of my head. I, I can't think, I know that there are a couple of great ones in that area, um, but I can't remember the names off the top of my head. But if you go to our website, uh, maincoastfishermen.org, um, the, on the monkfish stew uh, page, uh, we have uh, a list of all the places that uh, have the stew. And, um, and uh, and so you can you can search through there, um, and we've got the locations of different you know. There's a cute little map that pops up, and just a list of of different um, places that have the stew frozen. So um, you can find it up up in your way. And it, it's actually in most of the places that carry the stew are fish markets. So um, that would be the best place to go and, and check it out. 